I'm giving you a, a brief introduction into how to make your life more inconvenient. Um, by having what I would consider beyond basic security, by getting into intermediate cybersecurity or beyond, um, you are sacrificing a certain level of convenience. So um, I would not put myself at the paranoid level. You know, I'm not fighting against the Chinese or the Russians or our own government. Um, I just have what I would consider an intermediate level of cybersecurity that I've implemented for my setup. Um, and I have chosen to sacrifice a certain level of convenience. For example, logging, just logging into Google. I don't know what my Google password is. And I would encourage you to get to a point where you don't know what your Google password is either. One of the things that I'm going to talk about today is how you can protect and shield yourself from a lot of, of issues that, are, um, that you will discover and that will discover you out on the internet. So um, if you will bear with me, I am going to be adding um, some free software um, to this computer so that I can actually log into Google and give you the presentation that I have scheduled to give. Do you use LastPass? I do. Okay. Um, there are several password managers out there. Um, several, you know, there are several good ones that have um, free versions. Um, I, cho I choose LastPass. Um, And For some reason. <laughs> it's kind of like um, any kind, cyber security is just like physical security. There's always going to be a compromise or something new and uncomfortable that you might have to do to be at a level of security that's for you, right? Some people who want a, a very high level of physical security do things, you know, have things like concealed carry weapons. They might have body armor. They might have bodyguards. They, you know, they might have a lot of different things that you and I would consider extreme or might consider extreme, but for them and their physical security, they feel it's appropriate and they're willing to put up with the inconveniences associated with those pieces of physical security. Cybersecurity is going to be the same way. You might be concerned about using a password manager because it stores all of your passwords up in one location. Just like you might be worried about putting your physical security in charge, you know, someone in charge of your physical security. Now, if you find that guy off the street, yeah, I would be concerned too. But if you go to a place where you find a professional bodyguard who has the right training and the right background and, and the right equipment, then it makes sense to put your trust in that security guard. I feel the same way about a password manager. The people at LastPass are better at security than I am. They have paid people, make a lot of money to make sure that their services are very, very secure. So let me ask you a question. When you're signing into a website and that box drops down and says, would you like us to save your password? Should we be clicking yes? Absolutely not. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> Now, um, LastPass has been around for a long time. So has um, OnePass or KeePass, and there's several other good ones that have been out there. And probably at least 50% of those password managers have been hacked, right? So they've had some kind of breach where people have gotten some level of access to the information that's stored there. No one has had a full breach where they would get all of your passwords or anything like that but they have much better security than you and I have on our devices. So it's much less likely that anything's going to happen to your data if it's stored on their servers and you know, accessed through their networks than through our, our servers, our PCs, and our, our networks. Um, Now, I have one password that I know, and that was it. And now, I just put away my keys, but it's going to ask me what I have what's called two-factor authentication. Now, I'm getting in a bit over where we're going on the presentation, and I apologize. 
but I have a, a, a hardware token. It's a USB stick with a button on it. And I previously associated this USB stick with my account. So I can now take it on a public PC, um, and I don't know where this PC has been. I don't know who's done what with it. But I do know that I can log in securely on this using my token. Now, as long as the USB ports on this thing haven't been disconnected, there I go. Now, that's called two-factor authentication. One is the password that I typed in, and the second factor is something that I own. So it's not just the USB, but the fact that I have to push it. So I could leave this USB plugged into the computer, but if there was no one sitting there, you couldn't log in because you have to push the button. I am. Fortunately, on my laptop, I've got a second key. Okay? No one just has one key to the safe that you can't break into. You have double keys. That kind of redundancy we're going to talk about tonight in the presentation when we talk about real security. You know, if you're really into your physical security, you don't just have one bodyguard because he can't be on staff 24-7, right? He's going to have to go to rest and you're going to want another one if you want 24-7 security. So now I can log back in here. Or I can go back over to my Google account. I'm going to tell it my, my Gmail address. You'll also notice that I had two different addresses, right? I had Andrew Hatfield at live.com and I have this Google one. That's another thing that we're going to talk about. Um, now you'll notice that when I came in here, um, you can see that my password automatically filled in. I have no idea what it is. It's a random string of numbers and letters and special characters that I think, that yeah, that's 20, I think 20 to 24 characters long, um, just complete gibberish, um, but the password manager remembered it. And if you see that little red square, it tells me that I actually have three Gmail accounts that I could have logged in here. So I have one for another organization that, I, that uses Gmail. I have a second Gmail account plus my primary Gmail. But I don't know any of their passwords because they're all stored in my password manager. Um, and it's not that I'm worried about some terrorist is going to come and you know, like break my arm if I don't tell them the password. But I am worried about making sure that each website has its own password. Having that kind of unique password for each site is very important on the internet. One of the things that we're going to talk about is, we're gonna, um, is to prepare for a break-in. You are not going to be able to prevent a break-in. If someone wants into your house, they're going to get into your house. It's the same for your web, your web accounts, whether it's Google or the NSA or whatever. If they want in, they're going to get in. Your hope is that you're going to be buried in the hundreds of millions of people and that they're not really that interested in you. The other thing is, the same as your house, you might have a security system. The primary goal of that security system is to dissuade people from trying to break into your house, right? And maybe to let the police know if someone do break, you know, if someone does break into your into your house. But it's not really there to prevent people from breaking in. Your the idea here is to make it more difficult for them to hack you than to hack your neighbor or to hack someone in Croatia, you know, anywhere else on the internet but your address. Um, again, um, I have Google asking me for my security key. And now I'll go to Um, so I apologize for that uh, kind of brief um, jump ahead. Um, I will uh, go back and um, introduce myself. Uh, my name is Andrew Hatfield. Uh, I have been hired by the uh, St. Johnsbury Athenaeum to provide community technical support. 
Um, I'm here every Thursday from 5 to 7, um, except for the days that we're closed. Um, I am here to answer questions about how do I um, remove this from my computer, how do I get this from my computer to my phone, any kind of um, thing where you feel like you could be further educated on the use of a computer or the use of um, your device is something that I always want to be able to help with. I can't say that I always have the answer right away. Um, a nice lady brought in her Kindle, which was several generations old, and I'd always been used to managing my Kindle from the computer, but she didn't have one. So I had to study for a week and then come back and show her how to manage the Kindle just from the Kindle itself. So um, I haven't found a problem that I haven't been able to figure out yet. Um, sometimes it might be as simple as reboot your PC, you know, power it off and power it back on. I hate that answer, but sometimes it's the accurate one. Um, but I've been doing this for over 25 years. Um, I really grew up with a computer in my hands. Um, it's been always been easy for me to um, understand how computers work and have really learned a lot through the work that I did as a project manager um, and providing this kind of support for small and medium-sized organizations um, on how people best use the technology that's out there. Um, there's some amazing things out there. A lot of it is just knowing what's available um, and knowing where to go to get it. Um, I wanted to talk about cybersecurity and I wanted to talk about it now because a lot of people are getting ready to um, go do a lot of shopping. You know, I think um, shopping trends have gone online quite a bit um, where I think something as much as 50% of the Black Friday, Cyber Monday um, shopping is all done online now. Um, there are a lot of things that happened when we created the internet and that was done by um, scientists and done by students and professors um, at universities originally and so all the protocols they built were made for sharing and the internet is great for that um, but what they did not do was they did not build it for security so once the internet got popular criminals found that it's sometimes easier to pick your online pocket than it is to pick your physical pocket um, these might be words that you've heard in the news phishing, ransomware, crypto, you know, crypto jacking, um, DDoS, there's lots of different terms, um, but basically they're all about someone using something that's not theirs for their own benefit. Um, and these are real risks. These are big things that happened this year and they continue to um, expand and um, diversify. And most of these are going to be topics in 2019 as well. Um, we have made a lot of good strides in cybersecurity over the last couple of years. Um, Department of Homeland Security is now in charge of cybersecurity for the United States, um, and they are holding regular conferences to educate business owners, educate um, government members on how to improve the cybersecurity um, infrastructure. Critical infrastructure is especially important. Um, you know, I noticed. Um, not too far from here is a big um, hydroelectric dam. That would be considered critical infrastructure for the United States, that kind of energy generating capability um, is the target for hackers. Computers are everywhere. There's a computer inside that projector. There's a computer that runs these, um, the HVAC system here. Um, obviously, I'm giving this presentation on a computer, but it's you know, not just your phone and it's not just a laptop. There are computers in everything, and there are lots of computers running that hydroelectric power generating plant um, on the river. And all of those are things that people want to get access to for their own mysterious reasons. Um, so when I talk about cybersecurity, I'm not just talking about how to protect yourself, but it's how to really be a responsible cyber citizen. If you have an unsecured wireless network at home, it's not just your security that I'm worried about. It's people using that access to the internet for nefarious reasons and nefarious means to do bad things through your unsecured connection. So it'd be like you leaving the keys in your car and allowing anyone who wanted to use it to drive around and rob banks or do whatever they want to do with your car. It's not something you would do in your physical world, so you shouldn't be doing it in the cyber world. So this is not just about your security, but about the security of our country. 
um, that's at stake here. But there are a lot of things that we can do easily summarized in three steps. Um, I was thinking about having, instead of shield, call it protect, so that this could be P-U-B, pub, maybe something a little bit easier to remember, but shield is a good um, place to start. Sh if you think of a shield, it doesn't cover your whole body. It's not guaranteed protection. And none of the tools that I'm gonna talk about are guaranteed protection. But you can use that shield in a smart way to protect yourself from a lot. So shield is a good use for um, that term of just that initial step of setting up protections around your cyber assets. Um, updating is going to be important. And the, the last one is backup. Um, remember I talked about always making sure that you have a second key or um, a second lock or something like that. Um, backup is, is your way of ensuring against loss. You know, almost everyone has, hopefully has health insurance, life insurance. Backup is your cyber insurance. If you don't have a backup and you bring your laptop to me and I say, well, we're gonna have to, you know, I can't get access to this, we're gonna have to reinstall Windows, and you lose everything, you're gonna be very upset in a lot of cases. If you don't have backups, you're not fully safe. You're only safe if you can bring me your laptop and say, do whatever you want with this, all of my data is already safe over here. So these are the three areas that I'm gonna talk about tonight to make sure that you have the basics of cybersecurity for, um, for yourself and for those around you. Um, for me, the first step, um, something that everyone does on a daily basis is check your email. Email is going to be the number one way of spreading bad software, viruses, malware, Trojans, you know, every of those words that you've heard and, or can think of or haven't heard of and can't think of, vast majority of it, 90% comes via email. There are things that you can do every day to keep yourself safe in that environment. The first one is any email you receive don't click any links. Number one way for them to get um, software, uh, malware installed or a virus installed on your computer or on your device is to get you to do it. You're going to click that link which is gonna take you to a website which is gonna download that software and run because you just told it to. I received an email three days ago from my bank that says, we detected an address change on your account and we're sending you this email to let you know. If there's a problem, please you know, visit our website or give us a call. And it provided a link to their website and it provided a phone number to give them a call. Did I click on it? It had my name. And I checked and make sure that they were the ones that really sent it and I can show you how to do that, I will. I didn't click that link and I didn't call that 800 number. I pulled out my credit card and I looked at the 800 number on the back of my credit card and that's the number I called. Well, the email was from them. They were just doing an address update where they take your zip code and add the plus four digits to the end of it. They just had forgotten to turn off the email notification system. So they had sent this email out to their hundreds of thousands of customers. Um, and their call center was getting flooded because of all these people calling in to say, hey, I didn't change my address, what's going on? But the point is, is you cannot be too paranoid about your own emails, okay? I have a policy where I never click on any link that anyone ever sends me. If someone sends me a link that says, hey, here's this YouTube video, I take it and I type that link into YouTube. Or I go to YouTube and I search for that video, you know, the title of that video. I do not click on links. That is their way of tricking you into installing the software yourself. No matter what, you, you know, what else is on your computer, if you tell it, yes, install this software, it's going to do that. So the key here is to not get tricked into doing that. Um, the next thing is going to be to make sure that the person who, sent, who says they sent it is actually the person who sent it. Um, I'm gonna tell you a, a, an anecdote. My wife um, has a, a, an account on Yahoo. And as you might have heard a while ago, Yahoo got hacked, right? 
So her Yahoo account was compromised. And that Yahoo account was the one she, that was her primary email account. She used it for all of her friends and family and things like that. Well, I got an email from my own wife saying, hey, here's this, you know, go visit this cool site on Airbnb. And everyone who knows us knows that we love to travel, we love to stay at these neat places, and so it's perfectly logical to expect an email from my wife to say, hey, check this out. But when you see your list of emails, and it says from Becky, Becky Hatfield, my wife, and I floated my, my cursor over that word, well, you can't see my cursor here, um, I floated my cursor over her email address. And it didn't say Becky, it didn't say Becky Hatfield. It showed some long string of random numbers and letters at some place in, in um, Brazil. You know, something, something, something dot BR. So I knew that that email did not come from her. But it went to me and four other friends and family members. So I immediately sent out an email saying, hey, ignore this email from Becky because it's not her. But that's the kind of thing that they can do when they get these big hacks, is they can get information about you and tailor that, get that information, tailor that to get people to install stuff on their computer. So really don't click on any links and always check if that email is really coming from where you think it is. Um, if you have any question, Every good email provider, Microsoft, Google, all, Yahoo, all of them have a spam folder. And one of the things you may not know about that spam folder is that you can open those emails up in the spam folder, and at least in Microsoft and Google, it does not go out and retrieve any information from the internet. You know, a lot of times you'll have an, uh, an email that has lots of pictures or buttons to click and things like that. All of that is sending a, a clue to the hackers that says, hey, Someone opened your email, and they're at this address, and they're online right now. Information that you don't necessarily want them to have. If you open that email when it's in the spam folder, it doesn't send any information out. It pulls up exactly what they sent, and that's it. Still don't click on anything, but you can then you know, kind of look and see what that email is. It might have had a generic subject heading or something like that. You can open it in the spam folder, without kind of triggering any alarms to the people who sent the email. So I've done that. Um, you know, it's again, not anything that you would click on or, or um, you know, but you can always open them in the spam folder and have that safety that you're not going to send out an alarm. Um, the last one I talked about and I demonstrated it already, um, I have separate email for separate subjects. I have an email that I use for social media. I have an email that I use for banking and medical. And then I have an email that um, is kind of private just between friends. And I might generate some emails, you know, if I'm going to a website that I don't, you know, I don't really know about, um, I'm kind of interested, I want to explore it more and ask me for my email and password, I won't give it my email. I'm gonna go get a new free email account somewhere and use that. Now, I don't have like 500 email addresses out there. There are some that I've used once or twice and then I get rid of. But one of the things, if you have one email account, you'll notice that your spam folder starts to fill up. And it's only going to get bigger and bigger. So I highly recommend that kind of segmentation so that you're not using your banking email, which is half of your login, right? Your email and your password typically are your logins. You're giving the hackers half of your login if you're using the same email address for everything. Sure, have one email address that's out there that you, you know, use in social media, that you use for a generic website, and you don't care if you get a bunch of spam. But I really recommend having multiple email addresses so that if one gets compromised, you don't lose everything. One of the things you do have to be careful about is a lot of times now, email providers are asking you for a, a backup email address, right? So that if something like your account gets locked, they can send you an email to this other address. Be careful doing that because if someone gets access to that email address, they now know what your secondary email address is. 
So you have to just kind of be aware how email is used as half of your login to make decisions about how you want to separate and segment those, um, those addresses for the use of your login. So these steps here are really going to make a big difference in how secure your email is. Um, I do recommend using web email. Um, the one thing that I don't really talk about a whole lot here and it has to do more with privacy than anything else, but is really making sure that you are not a hoarder. Um, I'm guilty of it. I used to have huge files of, of emails back to 2004. Um, every email I'd ever sent was stored in my archive file. I want you to know, and you know, um, for those people who are concerned about your privacy, the government has the right, we've get, you know, the lawmakers have passed a law that says any opened email that's in your email account can be accessed by the government without a search warrant if it's been there for more than 60 days. If it's unopened, it's more than 30 days. So don't think of your email as a place, a place that's private, okay? If you have things that you want to save, my recommendation is to create an offline archive um, using a, a software like Thunderbird or, you know, there's lots of different email clients that are out there. If you feel you have to save it, download it and save it offline you know, or save it on your computer. Don't save it up in the cloud. Um, one of the, you know, the real security reasons for doing that, not just privacy, is the example that I gave with my wife. Because her Yahoo email was compromised, and because she had kept all of the email that were sent, you know, on certain subjects and things like that, the hackers now had open access to her preferences, what she liked, who she contacted. All that information was used to create an email that was very attractive to her friends and family to encourage them to install bad software on their computer under her name. So when something like hacking of, of Yahoo happens, there's real consequences to storing all of your emails there. Um, and that's one of them. So email is a big piece of, of keeping yourself secure and safe from a lot of the, the threats that are out there. Again, something like 90% of malware is delivered via email. There's, they're coming up with new names for it all the time. Um, it started out being called, just called phishing with the PH. Um, now it's called, and then it became spear phishing when they use very specific details like my wife's love for travel and staying in unique places. That makes it a spear fish. And now they have it, it's called business email compromise, where I can get the name of your boss and then I can send you an email that says, here, look at this spreadsheet and give me, um, you know, give me your opinions by the end of the day, right? Now you've got this sense of urgency and you get this, you know, with an attachment from Excel in your business email and it looks like it's coming from your boss's business email. Most people are going to click on that and open up that Excel spreadsheet, which happens to contain a virus, which then locks all of the files that that person has access to and shows a screen that says, these files are now trash unless you send me um, some Bitcoin, right? If you send me ransom, I'll give you the way to unlock these files. So that kind of basic email security applies in every environment that you're in. Um, you have to be very careful when you're talking about email because you really, it's not built in a secure way. Um, there's definitely ways to take email security up to the next level. Um, we can talk about that later if you have specific questions. There are email providers that encrypt your email from end to end. Um, there are um, lots of things that your businesses can do to separate attachments. Um, there's sandboxing, there's lots of ways to make email more secure, but these really are the key concepts to remember. Um, next thing I want to talk about is browsing. This is another thing, web browsing is another thing that most people do on a regular basis um, that is a real risk in some, in some circumstances. Um, two ways that I really recommend that just basic steps for increasing your cybersecurity while browsing, one is to use an ad blocker. There's many reasons to use an ad blocker. Um, they're very easy to install um, and they speed up your browsing because it prevents the downloading of, of that advertisement. And if you're on a low bandwidth or you're you know, kind of out and you have intermittent connectivity, things like that, having an ad blocker can speed up your browsing. And not only that, wow, it really reduces clutter on your screen. You know, I don't know if, you know, because I've had an ad blocker for so long, 
when I come, you know, come here and get on a public computer and I see all the ads that are actually on the screen, it blows me away. Sometimes, you know, if your screen isn't very big, half of your screen can be taken up with ads rather than with the content that you're looking for. Um, so an ad blocker is a great way to do it. Um, ads are an excellent way to deliver malware. They know that ads are designed to provide you with something that you think that you want, right? That's, these targeted ads are a big thing. And hackers know that, bad guys know that. You can create an ad that looks like the Home Depot, you know, 50% off coupon. When you click on that, it doesn't go to Home Depot. It goes to the hacker's website that looks like Home Depot, where all you have to do is enter your name and address and phone number, right? And maybe your driver's license number or some crazy thing like that, and then you'll get your 50% off coupon. Ad blockers will prevent a lot of those kinds of things from coming up. Next thing I've already talked about, you saw me use it. It's a password manager. Um, I have some handouts from the Department of Homeland Security. They're going to have this printed out. It's just one page on two sides um, that has their recommendations on how to um, create strong passwords and keep them safe. And I know lots of people who come here um, and they pull out their password piece of paper. And it has the account and the password written down on it. And that's a huge, huge improvement from what I know a lot of people do, which is use the same email and the same password on every site they go to, no matter what kind of site it is. It could be their bank, it could be their doctor, it could be some unknown website that had a great deal on you know, tissue paper. Um, they use the same login and password for every site, and that is about the worst thing that you can do. Because again, I guarantee every site that you go to is gonna be hacked before the end of this um, decade. You know, within the next two years, every site's going to be hacked. If they can hack Yahoo, they're going to be able to hack Google, they're going to be able to hack Microsoft if they haven't already. Um, they hack Target, right? Big retailer. Um, if you have a unique password, all they've compromised is that one place, right? So every time we get, we see it in the news or I get a, a, an update, I tell my wife, I know that we shop at Target, go change your Target password. That's all she has to do. She doesn't have to go to 50 websites or 100 websites to change the password on all of them. But I know that, that they've gone, the hackers have gone and said, okay, I wanna use, they tried to use her Yahoo login on some websites because she got notification that said, hey, we've got suspicious activity. Um, and that was one that um, you know, she used with her Yahoo email address. So all of those breaches um, are a big deal it's much less of an impact to you if you just have a, one unique password for that site and that's it. Because what they're doing is they're collecting all of those passwords, they're adding them into a program, and then they're going out and scanning all these major sites with your email address and trying to log in with that password. It's automated, it's fast, it's cheap, it doesn't cost them anything to do, and you would be amazed at how many hits they get because people use the same login and password for every site. These two things, these two categories, email and browsing, and these six steps will protect you from 90, 95% of the stuff that's out there. Next step is not your behavior, but it's stuff that you can buy, stuff that you can do to add to that shield, okay? That first page was the main shield. It's the straps that you hold onto and it's the plain piece. The rest of these, they're just the spikes, okay? These are all things that you definitely should have, but um, that first page is your behavior is going to be the biggest impact. Have an antivirus, have an anti-malware. People will ask me what's my advice. Um, I used to be a big fan of Kaspersky's. Um, there's a few other web um, um, sc virus scanners that are out there that have come, you know, that kind of go up and down on the ratings um, across um, sites that I trust. Most of the sites, if you type in best antivirus 2018, you're going to have three full pages worth of paid advertisements, okay? So top10bestreviews.com, all of those are paid. 
vast majority of the sites that you go to in the first, first set of results from Google or whatever, um, Bing or whatever you use, those are all going to be paid, whether they tell you they're paid or not. But having an antivirus, having anti-malware software, these days is better than not having it. As long as you are going with a reputable, well-known antivirus. Don't pick the one that pops up and says, hey, your computer is infected. Click here and we'll you know, download it and um, it's only $9.95 and we'll remove the virus for you. For, hopefully you won't see that because you have an ad blocker in and the ad blocker is gonna cop, you know, stop that kind of thing. But if you don't, you should be running a good antivirus that says, hey, wait a minute, this executable that you just downloaded that you think is great software has this virus inside it. Um, honestly, the free ones, 95, 98% as good as the most expensive antivirus you can find. There is a free service out there called VirusTotal.com. It actually has, I think now, 52 antivirus engines that it has running on its computers. So you can take a file, upload it to VirusTotal.com, which is what the Department of Homeland Security and now the Department of Defense is doing. They're uploading, it's great, now they're uploading their, um, their enemies' um, malware to that site so that it now has that as a, a known malware. Um, but you upload it there, it runs it through all 52 engines and will tell you if your fi um, file has been detected as a virus by any of the 52 engines. I'll let you know that the hackers also have access to that website so that when they're creating a virus, they create a virus and then they upload it. And if it gets caught by any of those antivirus, they go back and they rewrite it. So they've got the same tools that you do and I do. Um, very smart. But um, having one is better than not. Um, it used to be that, the, um, and if you've got a really old computer, you might find a little bit of a performance hit um, because they're always scanning the hard drive. But if you've got a relatively new device nowadays, antivirus, it's almost like it's not there. But Microsoft Defender, the one that comes built into Windows, it's actually pretty good now. Used to be not so good. Now it's actually pretty good. Um, the Clam AV, Clam Antivirus is a, um, a free antivirus that's open source. It runs cross-platform. You can get it for Mac, you can get it for Windows, you can get it for Linux. Um, it's updated quite frequently with new definitions for viruses and malware. Um, it's very good. Um, Avast. Um, there's several good ones out there. Just don't get one based on an advertisement that popped up in front of your PC telling you that you're infected. You don't have to go out and spend 60 or or $100 on a full suite um, at Best Buy. Um, you can get free tools on the internet. And if you have questions, you need some recommendations, I'm happy to give them. Um, I mentioned a few names. Um, a lot of very good antivirus software out there. But again, this should be your last resort. If you're following the behaviors on the first page, you should get very little information, you know, very little feedback from the soft, this kind of software. Um, next, I'm gonna talk about a firewall. Firewalls used to be a big deal. They're not quite as a big of a deal anymore because um, hackers are getting more advanced. Um, it's still good to have one. The key feature here on a, on a firewall is to make sure that it's a two-way firewall. The old firewalls used to just focus on what was on the outside and stopping things from coming in. Nowadays, it's more important for you to understand what's leaving your computer. So um, software firewalls are just as good as hardware firewalls. You don't need to go out and companies spend tens of thousands of dollars on firewalls. Microsoft has one built in. Macintosh has them built in. Um, a lot of the antivirus suites that you buy will enhance that kind of thing. Um, firewalls now can be used to scan for intrusions and look for signatures and things that aren't just viruses but like command strings and all kinds of things that can be done with a firewall. The key is to have one and to have it turned on and have it updated. Um, and again, key thing on the firewall is really you want to protect what's going out of your computer. Um, and that's what having an extra firewall really does. Um, and this piece is, is not quite as, maybe not a, um, a topic that a lot of people talk about, but having um, software security. Um, I, as a, pr a project manager, I worked on software development projects where banks would be updating their software, creating new systems and things like that. 
Um, it's really been a topic of discussion inside the industry for maybe five years in a real serious kind of way. I mean, it's always been there, but it's really serious now. Um, and built, making sure that your software is built secure. One of the things when I sit down with people and talk about their computer um, is what the industry calls attack surface. Um, if you think about you know, how you do a sword fight, they teach you to fence like this, right? They don't teach you to fence like this, right? This is how you block someone. This is, not, this is how you fight someone. You want to have as thin of a profile as possible, not just in a sword fight, but also in your cybersecurity fight. So I like to um, use the analogy of your home security again. If any of you have ever got out, gone out and tried to buy a home security system, you know that they'll come out and do an inventory and what they'll do is see how many doors and windows you have. That's usually the first step. And you're gonna get charged for every door and every window because they need to make sure that those doors and windows, which are the easiest way to get into your house, that they're all secure. The cybersecurity equivalent of that is your software. Microsoft Office is a huge target for hackers because it's a popular software, a lot of people have it installed. I know that if I write something that, that hacks through Microsoft Office, that I'm gonna have a big, you know, big opportunity to choose from all of these different targets out there. A lot of people have it installed. Um, another one that I cringe every time I see it, Adobe. Adobe Acrobat, what a lot of people use to open a PDF file is installed on vast majority of Windows computers. It's also another big target for hackers. Um, any of that kind of po very popular software is also going to be a very popular target. So um, I'll talk about it a little bit further down when we talk about taking inventory of your, of your assets, but making sure that um, you know where your software has come from that you're not buying your antivirus software from a pop-up that says you're infected. You're not buying your um, browser, you know, you're not getting your browser from something that pops up and says, hey, we can make you go faster, right? That you're making informed, secure choices on the software that you're installing on your device. Big difference. Um, I'm gonna talk quickly about network. Um, if you have a home network and it doesn't have a password to log in, Please change that. Um, again, I, talk, I know I mentioned it at the very beginning. Um, cybersecurity is all of our responsibility. If we don't, you don't, um, you might feel it's okay to leave your front door open because you live in a nice neighborhood or you live out in the country and it's not very likely that someone's gonna break in. But what a lot of people don't realize is that all it takes is for someone to get in their car and drive to a place that's a nice neighborhood and then break into that house. But the biggest difference is how easy that is to get in that car when you're talking about the internet, right? So, some guy in Russia, some guy in China, some lady in Yugoslavia, they can very easily get to your front door. They don't have to leave their chair when you're talking about the internet. Um, so secure your network. Um, one of the things that I first got here to the, the Athenaeum is I noticed we had unsecured Wi-Fi and I panicked. I said, how can you have Wi-Fi that has no security? Well, then I went downstairs and I saw what the infrastructure looks like. So um, you can't always judge a book by its cover, to use an, uh, a good uh, phrase for a library, um, and you can't always judge the security by what it looks like on the outside. Remember, you're not really, it's not whether you trust the Athenaeum, it's whether you trust who's running the Athenaeum's infrastructure, right? It's not that I'm afraid that the um, RV park that I go to in the summer that you know the RV camp owners have this nefarious plot where they're buying my banking information and selling it to Russian mafia. It's that anyone can get to that Wi-Fi from the internet and they can install whatever they want on that Wi-Fi hotspot if it's not secured. So I know that the Athenaeum uses industrial grade infrastructure and it's managed by a company that that's their job is to manage infrastructure. Um, and that makes me feel confident in using the internet here to log in and do all the things that you saw me do. Um, but please secure that home network. And um, if you're doing anything sensitive, don't use a public computer, don't use a public network. I don't care how good you are, something may happen. And it's just, to me, it's just common sense. Um, if you have sense, you know, if you're just gonna go look up where's the best place to get ice cream, knock yourself out. 
but if you're going to do banking or check your lab results or anything like that, don't do it on a public network or on a public, uh, public computer. Um, second category. Sorry if I'm going long. How, how are we doing on time? I don't wear a watch. Ooh. Um, I'll go through this. this um, the meat of it is, is done. Um, really here, now that you've got this kind of, um, all these tools in place, you have to make sure that they stay up to date. If you've got software that you installed on your computer 10 years ago because you needed to open some file that somebody sent you um, and you haven't used it in the last two years, probably shouldn't be on your computer. Okay, so obviously updating your malware definitions and your antivirus definitions, you need to make sure that happens. You need to do the patches that Microsoft sends you in, um, whether it be for Office or for Windows or for your um, Adobe Acrobat Reader or whatever those are. You need to update those, that software that you've got. But also take inventory. If you've got a computer that you've used for a long time, your phone that you've used for a long time, I guarantee you've got apps on your phone that you haven't opened in six months. Remember what I said on the previous slide. Every, one, every piece of software that you've got that's like that, it's a target. It's a window with an open me sign on it. Okay, if it's, not, if it's not maintained and supported by someone actively, I would question why you had it on your phone in the first place or your device on the first place, but definitely get rid of it now. You know, all of us have done stuff that's like, oh, we didn't think about it, we had, we, you know, it was just expeditious to go and do something. Whether you call it spring cleaning, you do it quarterly, however often you do it, you should be going in and updating and making sure that everything, all of your software is up to date. You know, Microsoft is great about sending out updates. Not all your software makers are. Sometimes you have to go out to their website and check and say, am I running the latest version? And if you see that they haven't updated their, you know, any version of that software for the last two years, I would actively encourage you to go out and find a maintained and supported version of software that does what you need it to do. Because otherwise you've got a security hole sitting there, I guarantee it. Um, same thing goes for your data. A lot, you know, there's, they're getting better and better at it, but a lot of software stores a lot of data in a lot of different places on your device. In Windows, hopefully it's stored in your user directory so you have one place to back up all, you know, just to back up that area. But QuickBooks has its own little area. Uh, Microsoft Office has stuff spread out all over the place. Um, make sure that you understand where your software is storing your data at. Um, so that um, if you go to remove that software and get a supported version of software, you can save your data um, and not worry about losing it when you get rid of that piece of software. Um, making sure that what you have is up to date and current, huge difference in um, your security posture on the internet. Vast majority of the break-ins that you hear about at corporations are because they have not updated their infrastructure. There have been breaches that have been narrowed down to servers, whether they be Java servers, you know, Tomcat servers, whatever you want to, um, whatever you, breach you want to look at, Probably 80 plus percent of them are known exploits that are a year old or older. And it's just that the corporation hasn't paid, it doesn't have a good inventory, um, they haven't hired enough people to do all the updates, but vast majority of break-ins are using known exploits. And so if you're not updating your, your, um, your devices, the software, your hanging out a welcome sign for a hacker. Um, zero day is the term that they use for when someone finds a new exploit. Zero days go for thousands of dollars on the dark web. Um, they're very hard to find, um, hopefully, usually. If you're, you know, if you're buying from reputable, you know, buying your software from reputable places, getting your software from reputable places, um, it's gonna be very hard for them to create a new exploit vast majority of break-ins from known exploits that are at least a year old. Um, the third and final area that I want to talk about for cybersecurity is backup. Um, if you um, think about what you have stored on your computer that you have valuable, I want you to think about how much value you would place on that. 
I, for me, I'm a photographer, and I started my photography in the digital age. So I don't have any slides. I don't have any, you know, my parents have the envelopes of negatives and things like that, but I don't have any of my own. All of my photographs are digital. Years of it. 15 years of my photography is all digital. I, have n I can't place a value on that. So I have three backups. I have the version that's, or I have three copies. So I have the version that's on my computer that I look at and that I might modify and keyword and do all you know, my photography stuff with. I've got a second copy that's up in the cloud that's there and it's secure and I pay for it to be secure and you know, off-site. And then actually I have a physical hard drive with a backup of that that's sitting in my buddy's gun safe down in Florida, which is probably not the safest place for it to be, but um, it's not in my house, right? So we all have this, you know, we all have risks of natural disasters, fires, um, burglary, um, computer just breaking. Think about the value that you have in your devices. And even like contact list. You know, I can remember back when my mom had a, a book, right? And it was, the, it was the address book of everyone, uh, you know, all the family, all the friends, and it had all the anniversary and birthdays and all of that kind of stuff. She did away with it. I was super impressed. But it's, now it's all online. But if I lost that, if I didn't have access to that anymore, that's hard to put a value on just like family pictures or something like that. You know, I wish I said, I, you know, give me the old version of that because I would take that just so that I know who I needed to keep up with. I can't, I don't even know who I need to keep up with. So think about the value, whether they be photographs, whether they be music, home videos, snapshots, you know, whatever. Think of the value that you've got there and then realize that you are going to get hacked. And that may sound very aggressive, and it's probably not going to be. It's probably going to be some kid in Iowa who's running a program that he downloaded from some porn website or something like that that he thinks he's going to be the hot hacker, right? He has no skill whatsoever. He's just using automated tools. And because you didn't update your, your software, because you didn't do safe browsing practices, you got infected and your, all of that stuff is gone. It's going to happen before you die. You're going to lose the stuff that you have on a device. Whether the device fails, whether you drop it in, the, you know, drop it in a lake, something's going to happen to those digital assets. And if that's the only copy, it's gonna break your heart. So if you have something that you truly value, you're gonna back it up, and you're gonna back it up at least twice. Right? So you have the copy that you have access to and then you have two other copies. You might hear about the cloud. All the cloud is is someone else's computer sitting somewhere else. And you, it's called the cloud because you can get to it from anywhere because it's the internet. Right? Um, there's good things about having things in the cloud and there are bad things about having things in the cloud. That's why I have a copy in the cloud but I also have a copy of my buddy safe because it's stuff that I really care about. But I tell you, if you don't have backups, you are not secure. That's the end of it. Because you will get hacked if someone wants to hack you. Only thing that you have going for you is your backup. Make sure that you have an offline version, whether it's a, a, a hard drive in a buddy safe, whether it's a little flash drive, whether it's those photos printed out. Have a backup somewhere. We don't have that luxury with a lot of things that are in our house, but we do have that luxury with digital assets, whether they be your favorite songs that you've downloaded. You know, I just realized that um, I lost a whole hard drive full of music and, and videos, and I realized that I had taken all of my CDs and turned them into digital files so that I could have them on my phone or whatever, and then I had given those CDs away, and now I don't have that anymore. I don't have that music anymore that I grew up with, you know, that I went to high school and it was my first cassette that I bought. Um, I don't have that because I had converted it to digital and in the process of backing that up, I got interrupted by something else that I had to do, paused, I asked my wife to get it out of the cupboard, she took 
it out, and it dropped on the floor. And now the hard drive doesn't work. Eight terabytes of digital information gone. Now, fortunately, a vast majority of that I had backed up, right? Critical things like my, um, my photos, all of our critical files, the scan, you know, scans of all of our, the stuff that we like to keep for whatever reason, but there were some things that I didn't have backed up. And I realized that I didn't have my music backed up because we had tons of music that we'd gotten from all kinds of places, but in there were included my copies of my original music from when I was in high school, and now it's gone. And I can't get it back because I won't even remember what I had on there. So don't let that happen to you. Include backup as part of your cybersecurity plan because sooner or later you're going to lose something. Backup makes is your insurance to make sure you can get it back. So those were the three steps. Um, I'll uh, go back to here. Um, Shield, you know, it's not going to be perfect coverage, but at least go out there and, and uh, make sure that you have safe behaviors, have some basic tools installed, antivirus, make sure that those tools and all of your software is updated and then make sure that all of your digital assets, all those memories, everything that you care about that's in digital format is backed up. Um, uh, have a little bit of time for questions and answers, um, and in case you're not comfortable doing it right now, again, I am here every Thursday that the, library, or that the Athenaeum is open um, from five to seven. Um, you're welcome to stop by. Um, if I can't answer your question um, right away, I'll do my research and uh, I'd love to learn, um, and we'll learn together. Questions? Yes. Do you like that? Um, I'm not a fan of it personally. Um, I think that technically it's a sound browser, and there are definitely aspects of it that I know that um, a lot of people do like. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to stand up here and say I'm a fanboy of Chrome. Chrome is one that I use, but I also use Firefox. Um, I have tended to stay away from Internet Explorer, um, primarily originally because it wasn't um, standards compliant. Microsoft had such a strong grasp on the browser market that they were able to make their own versions of, of standards out there. Um, and so you had things like at my work, I had to use Internet Explorer because they built things that only worked in Internet Explorer. But Opera is a perfectly good browser and I, um, one of my buddies uses it and loves it. Yeah, I use Chrome and I have trouble getting blocked on a lot of sites I want to see. Well, and Chrome um, is uh, made by Google and um, they've made some security choices or privacy choices recently that not everyone agrees with. Um, I will tell you that there's something called um, WebRTC that Google created. Um, their intent was good. Their intent was to speed up web browsing. Um, web browsing, HTTP, it's very back and forth. There's a lot of handshakes and a lot of exchange of data in two directions, which is very slow. So they created um, a new standard that allowed them to use what's called UDP, which is really one way, and it can be very large transfers of data, which is very fast. But it also bypasses a lot of the security that HTTP has in place with that back and forth. So there are things about Chrome that I don't like. Um, its integration with things like Google Drive and Google Docs is very handy. Um, and Google has made some good steps in um, two-factor authentication that you saw that I used, um, but it's not, it's not the only browser out there. Opera is a good one. Firefox, again, is I'm a strong supporter of Mozilla. Um, and there are uh, multiple um, other versions that are out there. Tor is a, is a decent browser. It's going to be a little bit slow, but um, it's based on Mozilla anyway. So yeah, Opera is a good, good browser. Is that key you were illustrating, is that cost? Is that a monthly subscription? The hardware key? Um, this, no, this actually, I think it's um, $15. Um, the company that I use is called Yubi, Yubico, um, and they actually have a website that shows all the different places that use these kind of hardware tokens, they're called. Um, my bank um, issued them. Um, I also know that like uh, PayPal issues a hardware token. It has a little button that you press and it gives you a little uh, six-digit code on the screen. Um, but you can go out and search for hardware tokens. Yubico is the one that I use because um, it uses these and it uses USB-C. They have a, a hardware key that's USB-C for my Mac um, and they're widely accepted. Um, it's, there's no monthly fee or anything like that. Um, there might be from a service provider that you also use, but for the key itself is a one-time uh, one buy. And then it's just a matter of picking 
you know, the service providers that allow you to do two-factor, one of the reasons why I use Google, because I can set up two-factor authentication. It's not very convenient sometimes, because in order for me to go do whatever I want to do, I have to have LastPass installed and I have to be able to use my USB key, but I know that no one from overseas is going to be able to get it because they don't have my physical key. Is the government doing anything to deal with internet insecurity? Um, I was on a DHS conference and asked that question, and the answer is yes. Um, they are getting out there and they are making themselves available to people who ask for help, which is a huge thing. I asked the question, I said, when are you going to start getting proactive, right? When, if you find a piece of critical infrastructure that's not protected, when are you going to do something about it? I had to stop and ask, you know, then I asked myself, well, do I really want my government reaching out and having that kind of, you know, authority to do that kind of thing? And fortunately, their answer was, they have to ask for help. So on one hand, personally, I think, there should be some kind of proactivity out there for critical infrastructure. Um, but at a minimum, our government, I feel our government is finally starting down the road of encouraging strong cybersecurity and starting to provide resources to people who have the desire but not the know-how. So where do you request that? Um, I, you can go to dhs.gov, um, and they have, a, I think it's called... Um, CC, NCCIC or something like that, the National Cybersecurity um, Infrastructure Command. Um, but they have, a, they have like a command center um, that handles all of those and then distributes it to the right um, area. Um, you know, so that if you are, for example, in charge of some government functions um, or if you're in charge of some in, uh, critical infrastructure, um, they have team members that um, they make available um, to people who request that kind of support. I'll just say one other thing or ask one other thing. It seems like our ability to understand is far outstripped by the, the technology. The layperson doesn't have a clue of what can be done, the type of cameras that can be hidden, the functionality of those cameras. Um, for example, I have friends that had to train in the Apache attack helicopters, and people don't know that someone could fly two miles away from your house and look in while you're believe you're in privacy, you know, the, the, it's overwhelming when you stop to think of it. Well, and, and um, the good news is that at least we're here in the United States and most of that technology is available to us and our government before it's available to others. Um, but absolutely. Um, and we're seeing more and more of that. Um, you know, this year I know we have, and I imagine we will in, um, in the near future as well, that um, there are actors out there, China, um, it's getting stronger and stronger. Russia has been strong. Fortunately, Israel is our ally, but they're also very strong in the cybersecurity um, arena. But yeah, technology is um, amazing. And um, the scary thing is, is that there's stuff that we don't know about. Um, so even though there's you know, things that the hackers know about that we don't, there's things that the hackers don't know about. Um, you know, if you look at um, some of the indictments coming down from the Mueller investigation that, they, you know, they indicted the 12 Russian hackers that hacked the 2000, you know, some stuff in 2016. If you really read that indictment, um, they're using some evidence that you kind of wonder how they got. Um, so it goes both ways. Um, and, um, you know, it's kind of up to your own political viewpoint on how you take that. But um, the technology is out there, whether it's in an Apache or on your, um, you know, on your iPhone. Um, you know, the, the fact that you've got an infrared scanning your face for face ID and that that could be on at any time and you have no way of knowing. Or that you've got an Amazon Echo or a Google Home at your house that's constantly on. Um, there are definitely um, changes happening in our world that a lot of people don't understand and that um, when you talk to a millennial or you talk to uh, Gen Z or, you know, these folks that have grown up with this kind of technology that they kind of take for granted versus me, you know, I grew up, um, computers had already been invented, but the internet hadn't. Um, it's starting to get scary to me. And when people like Elon Musk are talking about they're being scared of artificial intelligence, then yeah, it's, it's a scary world out there. But, um, you know, I'm not yelling at kids to get off my lawn yet, um, but I imagine I will be. Um, and um, the fact that I grew up with, you know, with this stuff, and now they're getting into things that scare me a little bit, I think it's just kind of, it's natural. Um, and we just have to 
I guess, talk to our elected officials about how to make sure that they understand that we have these concerns as well. Um, because I do think that it's at that level. And the American Civil Liberties U uh, Union is also um, on this, you know, to encourage people to be um, pushing our government to be more proactive in protecting our privacy. And um, I specifically tried to stay away from privacy in this conversation. Privacy, um, to me, is a related subject. You know, it's very hard to have real cyber privacy if you don't have cybersecurity. So it's kind of step A and then step B. Um, but we're in an economy now, you know, we're out of the nuclear age. We're in the information age. And we have been for a while. And a lot of people haven't really latched onto the idea that information is money. And that with sites like Facebook and companies like Google, that they're making money off of our information. And um, all of this AI learning, they, they do it from massive amounts of data that they've gathered from us. So every time a job gets replaced by AI, I'm gonna, you know, I kind of I have to chuckle um, because we've taught it how to do that. Um, so privacy is, is definitely a concern. Um, to me, cybersecurity is um, a slightly separate topic. Um, but absolutely, I think we need to um, have real conversations about those kinds of things. That um, I don't care what side of the aisle you're on, um, as soon as you put a camera in someone's house, you know, that changes the conversation. And unfortunately, a lot of times, we're the ones doing it to ourselves in the, in the name of convenience. Um, doesn't mean that we have to be afraid of it, though. Um, there can be good things that are done with it, um, as well as bad. You know, For all of this um, encryption and um, people complaining about how they can't get information out of terrorist phones, I also think about all the stuff that is available in China to these people who sit behind the Great Firewall and would have no idea what's going on in the rest of the world if they didn't have a way to poke a hole through that. So for every, you know, it's just like, um, you know, there's a common saying that guns don't kill people, people kill people. Um, computer is just another tool. And it's up to us to decide how to use it wisely and safely. Any other questions? Well, again, if you'd like um, to um, have further conversations and maybe a more private, um, Way I'm here every Thursday, um, five to seven, um, weather permitting, I guess. Um, um, so please um, have safe holidays.